So welcome back to some more physics here. And uh, so we're pretty much done with kind of dealing with some of these nicer forces that we've been talking about, namely gravity, the force of friction, weight, tension forces. And uh, I thought I would give you a couple of the mean forces. I know I've talked about this briefly, but I'll, I'll put in here, we'll say mean forces, mean forces. You say, well, what, what does that mean? And I would say forces that vary according to, well, the, the really mean one is time, but also position or speed. So we'll say forces depending on time, position, speed. These are not as easy to deal with. And hopefully you can kind of see why that is um, right away. Um, oh, just pointing it out is that the acceleration, you know that a, f a net force will cause an acceleration. And the issue is, is that once you have an acceleration, that will change your position and or your velocity um, in a less than straightforward manner. Okay? So that it's that, that idea there that uh, makes these a lot harder to deal with. In fact, I can put it, let's put this down. If I write down Newton's second law, if I put down F equals MA, MA, it's a little bit better, excuse me, let me, been struggling to find the right font size here, F equals MA, but now let me put in the differential form of A, you end up with something like F is equal to mass times D X squared DT squared. Okay. Now this is all still fine and dandy, particularly if your F does not depend on X T Oops, excuse me, x, t, or v. But the minute that you start plugging in, say for example, something that depends on the speed, you end up with what's called a differential equation. Now this is, this is a differential equation, but it's a lot easier because f over here doesn't change that much. Once this thing starts changing a lot, then it, you know all bets are off. There's a whole class of techniques used to solve this. So it's, it, it just becomes a lot more arduous to actually get an answer. So, so uh, mean forces. So be a pretty short video, but there's three that I basically think about here when we're talking about mean forces. And the first one I will give you is the gravitational force, the universal, universal gravity. Okay. Now, I'm kind of jumping out of order a, li a, a little bit. In fact, if you go and look at your book, this is like chapter 12 or 15 or something. It's a double-digit chapter. I think it better. it's better to put it in right here just because it follows with the context of thinking about the nice forces than thinking about some forces that are not so nice. And gravity would be one of those not-so-nice forces that you will see uh, from time to time. So let me go ahead and give you the the, the shtick, the spiel, and then we'll go ahead and talk about what each of these things mean. So the force of gravity, and sometimes you'll see me subscript it with a, a big G, is this capital G, I forgot the negative sign already, the capital G, then I'll put M1, M2, over R12 squared. And I'll put this in the R hat direction, and I will subscript this as 1, 2. Say, well, that's all nice and pretty. Let's go and talk about what each of these things is. So gravity acts between two masses. If you have mass, you are going to gravitationally interact with other objects. Now, it might be a really strong gravitational force if you have a big mass, say the Earth, or it could be something really small like this pen. Newton's law of gravity, this universal gravity, says that if you have mass, you are exerting a force on every other object that has mass. Now, most of the time we don't notice it because either the masses are really small or the distances are really large. So, so M1 and M2, as you've kind of, uh, as I've mentioned, M1 and M2 are the masses, masses of two objects. Now, going down to the denominator, I have R12. 
And this goes into the discussion I said, okay, the physical vectors video. I said there's a lot of there's a couple of different physical vectors. We did the position vector, right? The vector that points from the origin to the location of the object. We did the relative position vector, where we calculate how far the object's position has changed. And we called that one, I called that one delta r. But then there was a third one. This this delta r was a single object at two times. And then you had this third one, this relative position vector. And there I said, this is the vector that points between two objects at the same time. So here it's two objects at one time. And this is what we actually want to deal with today. That's exactly what we have in this situation of Newton's law of gravity. We need the distance between the two objects. So we need to find the relative position vector. And it's not just the distance or the magnitude of that relative position vector, it's the magnitude squared. So this is sometimes, this is referred to as an inverse versus square law. because you have this in the denominator. Don't worry, it comes back. Okay. There's at least one more inverse square law that you'll see in next term, which looks very similar to this. So I tell you right now, if you get familiar with this equation, it will pay dividends in the future when you see Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law, the forces between two charges, looks very similar to this. In fact, I will write it down for you. Okay. This here it will be kq1 q2 over r12 squared r hat 1 2. And essentially the only difference between universal gravity and what we call Coulomb's law, Coulomb, is that instead of dealing with masses, you're dealing with charges. Okay. So this is my motivation to you, or at least my encouragement to you that if you spend the time and get familiar with Newton's law of gravity, then you're actually learning a lot about Coulomb's law, how to apply it later on. So it's an inverse square law. It depends on the product of the two masses. Let's look at this g. This g is what's called the gravitational constant. Gravitational constant has a well-defined value and it's something that you can look up in the back of your textbook or you know when you're doing a problem you can just google it you'll end up with this number okay. and this gravitational constant it's a number it's 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th let's get our units right it would be newton meters squared per kilogram squared 6.67, yeah, there we go, Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Okay. This hopefully gives you a sense of, of why you need massive objects. You see 10 to the negative 11th, so that's a hundred billionth, right, 10 to the negative 11th. And so you do need large masses, one, or the other one is that you need the masses to be really, really close together. That's also a possibility. So... There we go. Now, this negative sign is always interesting, right here. Okay. That negative sign. And sometimes you'll hear me say, oh yeah, the negative sign can go with the direction. So the next question is, let's look at what this is. This relative, the r hat vector. Well, you know that r12 is the relative position vector and Let's say, here we go. Let's call this object one, we'll call this object two. And this is the relative position ve vector that say points from two to one. So we'll point it this way. And frankly, most of the time I just end up drawing it out. Okay. So if I'm interested in the gravitational force acting on one, this relative position vector is the one that points from two to object one. 
like this, our hat one, two. And now we notice this peculiar thing. Sometimes you'll hear me say, oh yeah, you can think of the negative sign as going with the direction. So let's think about this. If our hat one, two points from two to one, what does the effects of the negative sign have? It flips the direction of the vector. In other words, rather than having it, the vector point away, so it points towards our, or excuse me, it points towards object one, okay? In other words, if this, if it weren't for this negative sign, the gravitational force acting on one would have the effect of pushing one away from two. This would be the direction of negative r hat. And that means, and this has a profound effect, there are some, there are some negative signs that are just there. They're there because of how you choose your axes. For example, if you chose your axes a different way, you'd end up with that negative sign going away. This negative sign that we see in Newton's laws, Newton's law of gravity, is really important. It's not just some consequence of choosing some axes. This negative sign makes sure that the gravitational force acting on an object always pulls the two objects together. So this negative sign is really important, really important. Now, honestly, usually when I'm trying to think about this, I can't remember if R12 is pointing from 2 to object 1 or does it point from object 1 to object 2. Here's what I would recommend doing. Draw a picture and ask yourself which object are you thinking about. Are you thinking about object 1 or are you thinking about object 2? If you say object one and you have your picture in front of you, boom, you've got it. You know exactly how to get this thing. Rather, if you want, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with, you want to know the force on object two rather than object one, you've got your picture, you know which way that vector is going. Okay. So that would be some encouragement that I would have for that. And we're done with this. Of course, the next video, um, we'll get a little bit more applications of it. In the following video, again, more applications. But that's all I have for you right now in the sense of showing universal gravity. And you notice why we call it a mean force. As, say you're dealing with this, okay, these two objects, and you calculated out some gravitational force acting on one. Well, because of that gravitational force, object one will accelerate ever so slightly in this direction. And therefore, the distance between the two objects will now change, which means the gravitational force will get larger. And so you'll have to stop and recalculate the gravitational force. Well, of course, that changes the acceleration. The acceleration changes the distance between the two objects. And so then the object will move even closer. So then you have to recalculate it and you have to keep doing it. So it's a, what we call an iterative approach. I'll show you how you can deal with this using a computer later. And of course, in other chapters or other classes, you'll see how to do that from a mathematical standpoint. So let's move on to the next one. The next one I will call Hooke's Law. Hooke's law, or sometimes you'll see it stated as the spring force law, spring force law. I don't really care what you call it, so long as you realize, I mean, if you call it Hooke's law, I know what you mean. If you see spring force law, I know what you mean. And uh, it, basically, I want you to be familiar with both of the terms. So if somebody says Hooke's law, you know what they mean, and you're, you're okay, I got it. So Hooke's law, I'll give you the 3D version. Okay. And the 3D version would be, again, vectors. We'll say the force, uh, um, a force exerted by a spring is equal to negative K delta L. Okay. Now I'll walk you through this a little bit more, just like the last time. And you say, okay, well, first off, what is this? Okay. This K is what's called the spring constant. Spring constant. You've noticed that some springs are easy to stretch, some springs are really hard. Okay. The spring constant models how easy or hard a spring is to stretch. Its units, 
are in newtons per meter. So it tells you how many newtons you have to apply to the spring in order to get it to stretch a meter. Okay. So larger k's mean that it's harder to stretch the spring. Smaller k's, it's easier to stretch. Now you notice this is in meters, so delta L tells you how hard or easy or how far the spring has been stretched. So this is how far spring stretched. And I'll be I'll be even a slightly more particular here in a second. This is how far the string has been stretched. Now, any spring that you look at has some unstretched length. If you just put it on the table, the spring will naturally be at some length. We usually call that distance, I'll call it L naught here, and I call it the natural length of the spring. Natural length of spring. And so what delta L represents is the stretch length of the spring, which I'll represent as L, minus the natural length of the spring. So like I said, how far the spring is stretched with respect to its natural length. The negative sign, again, very important, right here. Okay. So let's, let's imagine, say you have a spring and there's its natural length, L0, and you decide to stretch it. So we'll even set up some axes. Let's set up an x-axis. I'll just have it going this way, like this. Oops, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, x. So x, and let's call this the natural length of the spring. And then say we stretch it. So this is the initial state. Let's say we stretch it to some distance of L. So if we calculate delta L, final minus initial, we notice that the delta L is a vector pointing in this direction, delta L. Now you already know this. If I take a spring and I stretch it, the more I stretch it, the more it wants to recollapse. In other words, the f as you stretch a spring, the force that that spring exerts in your hands is in the opposite direction of the stretch. So I take the spring and I pull it, the force that that spring exerts is on my hands is gonna be toward, back towards equilibrium. If I take a spring and try to compress it, that spring will exert a force to try to go back out to equilibrium. So here, what I've drawn is a spring where I have stretched it, delta L is going in the positive x direction, the force is going in the negative x direction. And that's what this negative sign does. It makes sure that if you stretch a spring, the spring tries to collapse back to equilibrium. If you compress a spring, it tries to go expand back out to equilibrium. Okay. So that's Hooke's Law. That's the second one. The third one I'll give to you, and more uh, this one I tend not to deal with as much, but it's a really cool lab, so I want to make sure that you see it at some point. The third one is the drag force. Drag force. And I should say air. So you're used to working with spherical cows in space. Maybe I haven't told you that joke. Remind me to tell you that joke if you see this video. But we're used to spherical cows in space. In other words, we completely ignore air drag. We, we pretend that there's no air. But you know that's not real. That's not physical. And here's, so here, we can do this. The air drag, the force of air, or any fluid, really, on an object, now is we define it as being one half rho C V squared. Okay. This tends to be the equation for air drag or fluid drag on an object when the object's moving relatively fast. Okay. Walk you through. Rho 
represents the density density of the fluid the fluid so first of all you know there's going to be a different drag acting on you if you're swimming in water as versus if you're flying through the air so this helps account for what material are you moving through and the density is usually given in kilograms per cubic meter Okay, so it's how many kilograms for a cubic meter of substance. The C is what's called the cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area. area. And the, the idea here is it depends on the geometry of the shape that's moving through the fluid. So you know, for example, that a porpoise is gonna be better at cutting through water than say, I don't know, a cardboard box, right? The cardboard box, it's flat, it's not gonna cut through as well as say a, a dolphin. So this cross-sectional area is a way of taking into account the geometry of the object as it moves through the fluid. And of course, your V is your velocity squared. So how quickly you're moving. So it turns out the faster you move through the fluid, the more the fluid exerts a force on you, the more drag, which is interesting or kind of cool. Anyway, you will sometimes see this written slightly differently. So it is also, I have seen it in other books, so I'll let you know about it, is that sometimes all three of these terms just get lumped together. So the one half, the density, the cross-sectional area. And I believe why you can lump the density is mainly people talk about air drag. So they're talking about the density of air. So it's a constant and they just throw it into this equation. So, um, but here it is. Uh, sometimes you'll see it written as drag equal to d, a drag coefficient times v squared. Oh goodness, you should yell at me. I am terribly sorry. I am completely missing my vector notation here. Oh, shameful. Going back to the original equation, negative sign, because it will oppose and I'll put v hat. So whatever way the object is moving, the drag force will be in the opposite direction. So I should include that opposite direction, V hat. There you go. Okay. And that's really all I have for these mean forces. It was just an introduction to say, okay, here's what it is. Here's what each of the things represents. Now the next one, so I, I think what we'll do for the next video is I'll show you how to calculationally include drag forces into your calculations. It's just pretty cool. Okay. And we'll do it through a technique called numeri numerical um, simulation, simulation, or you could think of it as inter it, in, integration. So numerical simulation or numerical integration. Um, so we'll do that. And I'll, I'll show you a video where we'll do it in Excel, although you could perfectly use whatever program you want. Um, I, I'll do it in Excel just because I figure most people are familiar with Excel. So, so I say thank you for your attention. I'll see you next time.